Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another summer worship service of 2023 with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Jill Thomas, and I am chair of the worship committee. Our minister, Reverend Jennifer Ennis, will return to the pulpit next week. And we will also welcome our uh, pastor, our Reverend Michael Brown, will be our guest speaker. For those that aren't familiar with Michael, he, was our, he is our minister emeritus, serving as the minister of this church for 27 years. And he retired in December of 2018, and this will be his first visit back to the pulpit. Uh, his sermon is entitled, Can the Religions of the World Save Us or Maybe Just Lend a Hand? And he's uh, going to the uh, Parliament of World Religions this week, along with a number of our people, uh, and so he will have reflections on the parliament. Because it's so special to uh, have Michael back in the pulpit, we're going to expand our coffee hour next week into a potluck. So bring your favorite dish, and instead of just a cup of coffee and a few snacks, we'll have a potluck. Uh, on August 27th, we will have the blessing of the animals. And I think I've told you guys, that's one of my favorite services. My little dog is all ready to come. He has his t-shirt that says Universalist Unitarian. <laughs> so that is my, one of my favorite services. And then on September 3rd, we'll have the question box service. You can write any question you have about anything, probably. Uh, but you could probably limit it to church or UUism, worship. Um, and Reverend Jennifer will answer some of those questions during the service and some of them throughout the year. <clears throat> then this leads up to our September 10th service, which is in gathering. And that's the official start of the church year, and we will have our water ceremony. Um, our Great Grove, it's a wonderful place to visit today. It's a great day to take a hike out there. Um, kind of nice just to sit quietly and listen to all the nature around you. Uh, the uh, beautiful grove that we take such good care of was once the home of the Peoria people. This was their ancestral home long before the first Europeans arrived. We honor them for who they are, who they were, and who they are today, and we pledge to be responsible caretakers of the land. Thank you for joining us in person and online. If you're new, Please help us get to know you. Name tags are a great invention. Uh, stay for visiting in Fellowship Hall or in the virtual coffee time on Zoom after the service so we can all get to know you better. We are a very accommodating bunch. We have hearing assist, assist devices, large print hymnals, a scent-free area. There are fidgets to borrow and a toddler safe area near the organ. There are two special chairs that are a little higher if you're uncomfortable in the pews. So if there's anything else that would make you more comfortable and help you enjoy the service today, just let one of our greeters know. Our church welcomes all, even the four-legged. Everyone is welcome, regardless of ethnicity, sexual orientation, creed, politics, and all the other groups I have yet to name. We are a creedless church, meaning we don't tell you what to believe. Instead, we believe that everyone must ultimately make up his or her own mind about the questions of spirituality and religion. The purpose of the church isn't to provide answers, but to assist and encourage us as we search for our own truth. Now, I found two things that you use find intolerable. They don't like intolerance, and they don't like people who forget to put their devices into worship. So please take a moment and put your devices on silent. Uh, I have a few announcements today. Again, I want to thank Kathy McNeil. She's been our volunteer pianist all summer. She's been invaluable to setting the mood for our worship services. I'd also like to thank the other people that have brought the main message to our pulpit uh, this summer. We've had a wonderful summer of lay-led services and I want to thank Kathy Carter, her husband, Brad Kiefer, Kiefoffer, 
Judith Shanahan, Pat Harris, Paul Resnick, Jeanette Gruber, Joy Surratt, and the Pagan Group that put on one service, and our speaker today, B.J. Lindsay. With the variety of topics you guys all brought to the pulpit, we had a very successful summer session. And I want to thank Melissa and Cullen, because I didn't always do things right, and they always seemed to make me look like I did. And I also want to thank Jesse and Regina. Your support for me this summer has just been invaluable. Uh, now, as part of how we welcome each other, we share a moment to greet our neighbors. I invite you to say hello to someone in the sanctuary, or if you're online, in the comments section. Please ask for consent before offering a hug or a handshake, and we'll come back to worship with, with the beginning of our opening hymn, Just As Long As I Have Breath. And Kathy will play that hymn through once while you return to your seats, and then we'll remain standing in body or spirit as we sing our opening hymn together. Greet.
our opening words this morning is uh, from our wonderful resource called Worship Web. If you ever want to find anything to use as a reading or any part of a service, there's a Worship Web that has just got so many things that are fun to do. Today we're going to use a responsive reading. Uh, <clears throat> BJ will be the first voice, and then we will respond. We are, we are reader number two. A Spacious Welcome by Sherry Woodbury. Welcome, who come in friendship, who long for genuine community. May you be graciously received here as your authentic self. Welcome, who come in curiosity, full of questions, or simply open. May you embrace wonder and encounter new delights. Welcome, who come heavy with fatigue, Weary from the troubles of the world or the troubles of your particular life. May you rest and be filled in this sacred space. Welcome who come with joy for flowing rivers and gentle breeze, for changing skies and great trees. May the grace of the world leave a lasting imprint in you. Welcome who come with thanks for the altruism of the earth and the gift of human care. May your grateful heart overflow and bless those around you. Come, Come let us celebrate together this, this wondrous, wondrous life. life. Our chalice reading today is All the Lights of Heaven by Cindy Landrum. For the wonder and inspiration we seek from the sun and stars, and all the lights of the heavens, we light this chalice. Um, I've said several times in this church that I kind of think of our church as a great place where we all share. We share our spiritual journey. We share our food at every potluck. We share time and energy to keep the church operational. We need those people to help us teach RE and make coffee after church. We share our monetary wealth to keep the lights on and to keep the sanctuary cool. We also share our monetary wealth with other agencies which align with our values. This month, our Share the Plate funds will be going to Hope Renewed Youth Conference, Inc. This organization provides scholarships to deserving candidates in the professions of teaching and law enforcement. The recipients commit to working in the community after they go to college. Ideally, this will help change the culture of both professions allowing for more people of color, and by developing an investment in the community from both working and living in it. Again, that's Hope Renewed Youth, Inc. And they will receive one-third of the undesignated offering uh, from the plate today, and the remainder will go to the running of the church. Please indicate if your offering is for a pledge, you want it all to go to share the plate, or you want it split between the two. There's envelopes in the pew pockets. For those of you that are more tech savvy, there's even a QR code in the order of service. Thank you for your generous support of this congregation and its work in the world. After the plates have passed, candles on the table in front will be lit. Then you are welcome to light candles if you care. This ritual is open to all. Come and light a flame of celebration, of love and good wishes, a flame of hope, a flame of sorrow, a flame of concern, or a flame of thanksgiving, or a flame of remembrance. These collective flames acknowledge each week that there are situations in our lives that vary, but our shared light provides a beacon to illuminate our past. Illuminate our past. Now, will the ushers please come forward?
behalf of the Barta family, um, I have been asked to share that they're dealing with the death of their adopted granddaughter, Hannah. Uh, Hannah died of cancer early on August 9th. She was only 21. We offer our condolences to Hannah's family and for all who knew her. And I have a message here for everyone who's planning on being at Chicago next week. Have a great experience to the 17 church members who will be attending the Parliament of World Religions. This will be a great experience for you all. Can't wait to hear what they have to say when they come back. In the wider world, I've lit candles for the first responders in Hawaii and for all those people who are losing their homes and their businesses. I light a candle for all who have been impacted by those flames. Now we'll hold one more moment of quiet for all the joys and sorrows that are in our hearts but remain unspoken. And now we'll sing the children's recessional, Go Now in Peace. this church for almost seven years and has deep roots in the Peoria community. She was born in Peoria, grew up on the East Bluff, attended District 150 public schools, and graduated as valedictorian from Woodworth High School. BJ is self-described nerd and enthusiastic lifelong learner. She has attended college in five consecutive decades and is on a 1,006-day language learning streak on the Duolingo what language are you ah. <laughs> BJ earned a bachelor's degree in history from Bradley University and attended two years of architecture graduate school at the University of Kansas. BJ also took coursework in the Master of Social Work program at uh, the University of Illinois at Ur Urbana and Champaign. And she's accumulated an L eclectic assortment of credit hours from ICC and Eastern Gateway Community College. Her professional background includes 26 years as a bachelor's level mental health professional, first in community ages, agencies, and then in psychiatric hospital. BJ also is proud to be a person in long-term recovery from mental health and substance abuse challenges. She's credentialed in Illinois as a certified public or certified recovery support specialist and now works for the state of Illinois as a social services program planner. Please join me in welcome BJ and finding extraordinary in the ordinary. Okay. Good morning everyone. I'm really, really delighted that you are all here joining us for this service, whether it is, whether you're present here in the beautiful sanctuary or at home watching the service streaming live, or maybe uh, a little bit later down the road watching it uh, recorded. It's really great to have you join us. I'm calling today's message, Finding the Extraordinary in the Ordinary. Today, I want to talk with you about how the stuff that seems routine and just not that special, maybe even boring, can become amazing, fantastic, and even magical if you learn to find the extraordinary in the ordinary. 
This can be a kind of superpower, and you don't have to be bitten by a radioactive spider or come from another planet to get it. I'm going to tell you how I developed this superpower within my life. But first, I want to tell you what my life was like before I realized that I could have this superpower. When I was a kid, I had big dreams. Those dreams included traveling the world. I always had a passion for wall maps, road atlases, and globes. To me, they were much more than mere objects depicting what our country and world looked like. They held possibilities of adventure and excitement and exotic experiences. My mom had a subscription to National Geographic, and I devoured the articles and photos that gave glimpses into faraway places and cultures that were so different from ours. The National Geographic magazines often came with folded up wall maps related to the articles, and mom always saved those for me. I put many of them up on the walls of my bedroom and the others I tucked away so I could pull them out from time to time and just gaze at them and dream. It was great. Day after day, I would look at those maps of those exotic places and imagine myself traveling to all of them someday, someday. But someday never came for the family that I grew up in. I was really fortunate to have two wonderful, loving, hardworking parents, but they just did not have lucrative careers. My mom was a longtime public school teacher, if that tells you anything. So, you know, um, the reality was that they just could not afford to take my three younger siblings and me on fancy trips around the world. They did provide us with a few wonderful car trips to other parts of the United States. And I'm really thankful for those beautiful memories and grateful to them for all that they did for us. But still, I longed to explore the rest of the world. And when I graduated from Bradley and moved out of my parents' house, away from Peoria, I figured it would not be long before I would finally see places beyond the USA. But my life took some unexpected turns. And some of them were wonderful. Eventually, I moved back to Peoria. Soon after that, I met and married Terrence and had two sons, Ross and Owen. I began a new career path in the mental health field, and life marched on. And what about those travel dreams that I've had ever since childhood, literally 50 years? Well, someday still has not arrived. You see, as it turns out, in all of our years together, Terrence and I still have not been able to scrape together enough money to travel outside the Midwest. Mental health issues can be really hard. And I'll be honest, life has been difficult for us in many ways, not just financially. I won't elaborate on those because I have intended this message to be uplifting. Really, I have. And I'll be getting to the uplifting part soon, I promise. But to get to the heart of what I want to share with you, I'm going to need to mention one more thing that is not uplifting at all. I'm pretty sure most of you are aware that our younger son, Owen, died unexpectedly on February 23rd of this year, exactly four weeks after his 24th birthday. As you might imagine, this has been the most painful and difficult year of my life. And Owen's death has felt at times like the icing on a giant bitter cake of hardship and struggle that Terrence and I have endured. For years, long before Owen died, I would wonder, when do I get my turn? When do I get to travel to cool places and experience exotic things and just have a real vacation for a change? When, when, when do I get to have fun like that? I felt sorry for myself. I felt deprived. At times, I even felt cheated and resentful. It felt as if those cherished dreams had been stolen from me. And when Owen died, when my worst nightmare became a reality, I just knew that my world would be changed forever. It has been almost six months since his passing, and I still believe that my path in life will never be, can never be, the same as it was before. But, but, since Owen's death, my superpower has revealed itself to me. And it has taken Owen himself and the way, and the way he lived his short life to show me this superpower. I have spent hours and hours thinking about Owen since he died, thinking about who he was and what made him unique and amazing. Many of you were familiar with Owen because of his presence here at services and church events. Um, 
whenever we were here, he was most likely hanging around out by the front door waiting to say hi to people as they came in. But none of you had the gift of knowing Owen like we, his little family, did. And I bet most of you did not know the extent of Owen's disabilities. The fact is, in addition to his autism, he had some significant developmental challenges. According to various psychological assessments, Owen had the mental age of a seven or eight year old child. His disabilities made it more difficult for him to fit in with other young adults his age. But, but, I also bet most of you did not know what a magical mind Owen had. In many ways, he truly did experience life with the mind of a child. He moved through this world with a childlike sense of wonder. He loved to explore. Have you ever noticed how a lot of kids just seem to incline to explore their surroundings? They're curious and often want to go all over the place, some, you know, for better or worse. Uh, it's not always a safe thing, but, you know, they're curious. They want to explore. And then we, you know, we're curious like that when we're young and then we grow up and we're taught and trained to rein that in, to rein in the curiosity because we're supposed to focus on the so-called important stuff like work. But Owen was perpetually curious and loved to explore. Whenever we took him into a store, it didn't matter what kind of store it was, he took delight in looking all around to see what treasures he could find. And if he found just the right Hot Wheels car or a snack item he had been craving, well, I wish that you could have seen the sheer joy on his face and heard the glee in his voice. I want to show you a picture. This is a photo from about 10 years ago when I took Owen to a grocery store and he found a package of string cheese. String cheese! He loved it. I think it appealed to him because of the way it is individually wrapped and it can be pulled apart into little strings, hence the name string cheese. Um, in the last couple years of his life, Owen began to really take an even more intense interest in string cheese. And whenever we would take him out for snacks, he, would, he wanted to look for those individual string cheese snacks, cheese sticks at whatever gas station we went to. And when he found the kind that he wanted, because he was kind of picky, he was very brand loyal. He wanted Kraft or Sargento, none of like the Circle K brand. He, you know, he was a string cheese connoisseur. Uh, but when he found the kind he wanted, he would let out this big, satisfied, ah, like that. He had that approach to life in general. The little things were special to him. The things that we might consider mundane, like a particular brand of root beer, for instance, seemed exciting, even magical to Owen. He'd say stuff like, they have a and w mommy. They have dad's root beer. He loved root beer. He loved each moment and, and embraced it. He loved to travel. We didn't go very far with him. I calculated that he never went more than about 475 miles from home in his whole life, but he loved road trips. And whenever we took him on those, those longer car trips to destinations beyond central Illinois, he really loved looking at the scenery. Even if we were just passing silos and cornfields, he'd point and say, silos, mommy, look at all the silos. How many of you get excited about silos? Owen did. Owen said many times, though, that he wanted to travel to various faraway places like California, London, Thailand. He had big dreams just like I always did and still do. But he did not wait for those longer trips to happen, to soak up every drop of joy from his surroundings and his adventures. That's what we called them, his adventures, even a trip to the dollar store down the street. He lived for the immediate moments, whatever and wherever they were. And I've realized since Owen died that there are a lot of valuable lessons in the way that he approached life and he had wisdom and a certain kind of genius, really, for appreciating his simple pleasures. Things like an ice cold bottle and of A&W root beer, which he could chug down in about 20 seconds flat, by the way. Um, 
a classic muscle car Hot Wheels that he could add to his collection. And a, a particularly funny episode of SpongeBob where he would just toss his head back and roar, laugh and laugh and laugh. And of course, the magical string cheese sticks. Even more importantly though, Owen relished every moment with the people he loved, including this beloved UU community. Because Owen packed so much appreciation and joy into each of his life experiences, I believe that he did live his life to the fullest. Despite his challenges, he was a profoundly happy guy. He continually found the extraordinary in the ordinary. Because Owen managed to do that, I was inspired to try it too. So how have I begun to do this in my own life with my various responsibilities at work and home? Well, first of all, I strive to pay more attention with my five senses. One author whose work has helped me with this is Gretchen Rubin, R-U-B-I-N. She has written several books, including The Happiness Project, which I read in 2011. That book describes how she spent a year focusing on a different happiness strategy each month as like a little experiment to see if she'd be happier. This past January, I downloaded her Happier app and I decided to take on her challenge called Outside 23 and 23. That challenge, is encur that challenge encourages participants to get outside for at least 23 minutes every day in 2023. Hence the name. The Happier app has a photo log feature for that challenge, so every day I can upload a photo I've taken outside that day to help me hold myself accountable. To be honest, with everything that has been going on this year, I've not always felt like even setting foot outside, and I don't necessarily make myself stay out there for the whole 23 minutes. Since I work remotely, it would be really easy for me to just hole up in our home for days on end. But I know that for me, staying indoors all the time is not the healthiest option. So I decided early on in January, even before Owen died, that I was going to give this a go. Uh, and I decided I was going to make the challenge work for me, and I would cut myself some slack. It's been a little more difficult following through with this since Owen died, but to be honest, it's been motivating enough to kind of pull me outside even for just like a quick 30 seconds to snap a photo just so I can upload it so I don't break my streak. But it's very helpful to have something like that to get me out of the house. And I have found that even just a minute or two to take that picture for the day is enough to break me out of my sluggish funk for at least a little while, and it's super helpful. What happens though, more often than not, when I finally venture outside, and I mean, sometimes I put off to like the very end of the day, I'm talking like 1030, I'm like, oh, I haven't taken a picture yet, okay. Um, but when I get outside, I'm reminded just how amazing and beautiful and yes, extraordinary, the natural world is. For accountability purposes, I could just snap a quick picture outdoors and not have any concern for how it looks, but the artist in me just, it's, it's hard to just do that. So I usually insist on trying to frame a shot that I think is fairly attractive. And I think I've managed to take some really cool photos this year. So here's one. Um, this is a picture I took on August 5th of a cicada on a weed growing in the cracks of the patio by our front steps. Check it out. Look at the green. Doesn't that color just pop? Yeah. And then the little yellow leaf there. Wow. Um, now, I know a lot of people are not fans of cicadas. They're kind of creeped out by them. You know, they make that loud noise and... And I'll, I admit, no offense, but I really wouldn't want one on me. Um, but have you ever really looked closely at a cicada? Even if you're not a fan of a cicada in particular or even insects in general, I encourage you to consider the cicada with an open mind. 
Isn't it extraordinary that such a small creature, I mean, this is, this is not life-size. It, it wasn't really this big in real life. Um, isn't it extraordinary that such a small creature is capable of making such loud noises? And isn't it extraordinary that these delicate-looking wings are, that are so thin, and you can see through them, isn't it extraordinary that they are strong enough and sturdy enough to carry the creature through the air? And if you consider this weed that the cicada is sitting on, isn't it extraordinary that this type of weed is so resilient and powerful with such a strong root system that no matter how many times it gets cut down by a weed whacker, it grows right back. Uh, I think it's extraordinary. There have been days when I wished it wasn't quite that extraordinary, but you know, it's kind of magical really. Here's something else extraordinary that I've noticed from taking my daily photos outside. I've got two more pictures to show you. Now these two photos show the exact same view. It's my favorite view on our whole you know, property. Uh, it's the exact same view facing northeast from our backyard. Now this one on the left, that's kind of purplish in the background, I took on Friday morning, August 11th, just two days ago, at 6.08 a.m. That's this one, Friday morning, 6.08. This one, with the clouds visible, I took yesterday morning, Saturday, August 12th, at 6.10 a.m. And look at the difference. It's just one day apart, almost exactly 24 hours different. Same time of day, same place, but the sky looks so dramatically different from this picture to the others. Why is that? Why is it? I'm sure there are a lot of scientists, people in the audience that could explain, and I could have looked it up, but I'm gonna remain amazed by the mystery of it all. It's really amazing, extraordinary, that our sky can look so many different ways. Nature is magical. I've been focusing on visual things in these examples, but vision is just one of the five senses. And there are ways to connect with extraordinary experiences using the other senses too. On the Happier app and on the website GretchenRubin.com, Ms. Rubin offers tips for enriching your life by exploring your five senses. She also released a book earlier this year called Life in Five Senses, How Exploring the Senses Gets Me Out of My Head and Into the World which has been exactly what I've needed so much over the last six months. One of my greatest takeaways from the book is that being more mindful of your sensory experiences can bring you more joy and fulfillment in life. And since I began paying more attention to my sensory experiences, I have learned some things about myself. I'm gonna go through each of the five senses and give you an example of something I find especially pleasant and even, dare I say it, extraordinary. Let's start with sight. I'm gonna talk about clouds. I, I admit, I love to look up at the sky and look at clouds. They are not only beautiful, but they are fascinating because they're never the same from one day to the next and even from like one hour to the next, they move around. Or maybe it's because the earth is moving too. I don't know the scientific reason exactly, but it's fascinating that they're constantly changing and then they have the different types of formations indicating different weather conditions. And I think it's amazing. Hearing. So we have this, this lake behind our house. You saw a little bit of it in those two photos that I had side by side. They call it a lake. I think it's maybe more of a big pond, but you know, it sounds more glamorous if you call it a lake, I guess. So it's a lake. There's frogs that live in there. And in the, in the spring, when the, when the evening weather is mild, and we have the windows open, you can hear the frogs. And I don't know how many different kinds of frogs are out there, but they make some of these lovely, like singing type, crooning little noises. I think it's just spectacular. Smell. Some of you may be aware that I love, love, love the smell of coffee. I love to drink it, but I think it smells even better than it tastes. And especially the freshly ground coffee beans. Oh man, I can just take a bag of that and just you know, how did human beings, though, even figure out that roasting and grinding coffee beans and then brewing them with hot water could make something delicious? 
I mean, that just seems like a weird random thing. Oh, hey, why don't we roast these beans? But it's phenomenal, right? Those of you who love coffee, there's a kind of magic to it. Taste. One of my favorite comfort foods is Indian cuisine. And I just love the way the spices are blended to make such deep, complex flavors. Um, and if you just adjust the amount of certain spices just slightly, you get a, a different kind of flavor um, profile. Um, but I crave that cuisine almost constantly. Touch. Not long after Owen died, I decided that I might benefit from having a sort of security blanket, so to speak. So I managed to find one that's in a beautiful, rich shade of purple, which is my favorite color. And the fabric is so soft. It's some kind of microfiber or something, but even after washing, it stays soft. So... You might have, no have noticed some of these five senses things I mentioned are elements of the natural environment, while others are human-made. Now, I personally derive an immense amount of joy and spiritual connection from nature, and nature offers endless opportunities for us to experience awe and wonder. But humans and their actions and creations also can be extraordinary. In this world where there's so much pain, suffering, conflict, and cruelty, it can be easy to overlook some very impressive human accomplishments. If you're interested in technology, well, I encourage you to think of the ways that technology has advanced just in your lifetime. My family still had a few rotary dial telephones when I was a kid. And now I'm holding this smartphone and actually reading my speech from it. And this phone is more powerful and versatile than any of the computers that were available when I was in high school and college including this giant mainframe in this building uh, in the engineering school at Bradley. And this phone's got a lot more going for it than those giant computers. Humans have immense capacity for innovation, ingenuity, creativity, and skill, and not just in technology, but in things like the arts and science. For instance, I can think of some incredibly talented musicians that have graced this sanctuary, right? You know, y'all know who I'm talking about, lots of them. And some of those musicians are talented visual artists as well. So how do they do so many things so well? So many creative things. It's extraordinary. But beyond any human gifts related to things like technological wizardry or creative arts, I hope you will consider just how extraordinary humans are in our capacity to connect with others in support, love, and friendship. When I get discouraged about how many terrible things humans are doing around the world, the country, and in our own local community, I find it helpful to remind myself that we are capable of exquisite, extraordinarily good things. The power of human connections can be truly extraordinary. For the most part, we build those connections in the so-called ordinary moments with people. Special celebrations and luxurious vacation trips certainly provide opportunities to create warm, once-in-a-lifetime memories with our loved ones. And I do aspire to have some of those in my life eventually, too. But so much of what cements the bonds of family and friendships is the everyday stuff. Humble meals and routines, simple daily rituals and interactions. I encourage you to think of someone you love who has died. What are the things you miss most about them? What are the experiences you most miss sharing with them? What are the foods you used to enjoy with them? In addition to Owen, I have experienced the deaths of both my parents, all of my grandparents, and my sister's husband. And here are some of the things I miss most about them. I miss watching afternoon cup games with my dad on WGN on his little portable black and white TV, about this the screen was like this big, on the deck adjacent to his mom's bedroom. And the years before lights were installed at Wrigley Field to enable night games. I miss my mom's workday ritual. As I said earlier, she was a, a school teacher, a longtime District 150 middle school teacher, in fact. And in the mornings on school days, her thing was to stand in the kitchen and smoke a cigarette while sipping a Diet Coke. Breakfast of champions, right? Uh, and I used to tease her about that, but man, I miss that about having her around. I miss having Sunday dinners every week at my maternal grandmother, Mama's house. Um, 
And she was fussy and fancy about it. We had to have the little salad plates with the little lettuce leaf, iceberg lettuce leaf under the little jello salad, and then a dollop of Miracle Whip on top. And most of us kids scraped the Miracle Whip off the top and didn't eat the lettuce leaf, but she kept doing it. She was old school that way. And I miss those. I miss the cinnamon apples that my, my paternal grandma made. And isn't it funny how those family favorite dishes that our ancestors made for generations don't taste quite the same when they're gone. And we try to make them possibly by using their recipe cards written in old school cursive, grease stained and possibly coated with like flour and stuff from decades of use. I miss my paternal grandpa's habit of wearing trousers and dress shirts all the time. He was a dressy kind of guy. Formal. I miss being the occasional recipient of a few of my maternal grandfather papa's sugar-free hard candies. He had diabetes, and I'm not sure what sweetener was used in those candies. Probably long been prohibited by the FDA, because that was the early 70s, but they had a weird flavor. But you know what? If he were around to offer them still, I would gladly snatch up a few because of the prestige of having papa offer to share a few of his special candies. It was like getting a little gift of a few gold nuggets. And as for my brother-in-law, Steve, I miss his big booming laugh and his skill for plugging holes in flat tires. He rescued me on more than one occasion. So these so-called ordinary moments in life, such as the ones I just mentioned, are where the magic happens. They are. They are truly extraordinary experiences in their own right, I believe. And I have learned, um, in some ways the hard way, that life is short. And it really can end without any warning when we least expect it. The moments we have with the people we love are treasures. Embracing the humble day-to-day moments can deepen our gratitude and nurture those precious connections. It's worth it. It's worth doing it. You know, that simple 10-minute interaction that you have with someone at coffee hour, you know, you just don't know how much that cements that connection with that person. Anyway. Back to my long-term dream, long-time dream of traveling the world. I really do still want to experience global travel, visit other countries, and interact with people in different cultures, and eat the food, and experience their architecture, and the natural wonders of the different geography, and all those exotic things. I'm not giving up on that dream, but what I've learned, what I've realized by the example that Owen has shown me, that I am not going to postpone my full participation in life while I wait to make those travel dreams happen. For the time being, at least, Peoria and Central Illinois are my world, just as they were Owen's world. This, this is where my people are. This is where I can find joy, fulfillment, gratitude, and connection. This is where my life will be magical. It will as long as I keep embracing the extraordinary, because in a way, everything that we call ordinary really is extraordinary. Thank you very much. Please join us in our closing hymn, Life Maketh All Things New. And Kathy will play it through once for us, and then we'll join in.
will extinguish the chalice with these words. Kindle new sparks by Deborah Burrell. We have basked in the warmth and, and beauty of this flame and in this community. As the chalice flame is extinguished, let us carry its glow within. Let us kindle new sparks within these walls and beyond. Our benediction reading is called Shine by Mary Edes. Like the cosmic dust following after a great Perseid meteor, we are the living remnants of time and all that has come to pass in its wake, briefly shining lights on the way to eternity. We are only visible to the naked eye for an instant. Take this moment to shine like the stardust you are May the light of our time on earth shine to bless the world and each other. Shine, shine, shine. <laughs>